Hello and welcome to the Cuyamunga Institute, our Q&A Conversation for Exploration series. I'm Paul Robert, the Executive Director and President of the Institute, and along with my wife, Laura Lee, the Director of Research, Education and Outreach, we want to thank you for joining us today. The Cuyamunga Institute's an independent, nonprofit research organization committed to researching consciousness and the human experience following the footsteps of our founder, anthropologist Dr. Felicitas Goodman. And as an educational institution we recognize to thrive, we must take an open approach. And we invite scholars in related fields to help broaden the scope of our own work and exploration. That's why we call it Conversation for Exploration. And on these weekly Sunday discussions, we've had a full spectrum of topics, from the arts to the sciences and everything in between. So visit our website at queermongainstitute.com. All of our presentations are available there for free. We're a nonprofit organization, so we invite you to become a supporting member. And for those of you that already have become supporting members, we thank you for your continued support of the mission of the Queermonga Institute. In every generation, daring scientists push boundaries and achieve breakthroughs. And they don't just happen. They're made by those willing to push the seams of the envelope, and even when they get pushed back by the status quo. For the advancement of our world, we need to ask new questions and remain open-minded. And today, we're excited to have such a scientist with us. And Laura, please tell us more, introduce our special guest. Well, we find that with every guest, with every conversation, it helps us fill in one more piece of that grand puzzle of life, the who are we, where did we come from, where are we going, what's it all about? And I find anomalies have a particular value and role in this quest. They can serve as red flags waving at the boundary line of the worldview, saying, over here, take a look. Your worldview could use a bit of a stretch to wrap around this. And when those anomalies point to the big, big questions on the order of, are we alone in the universe? Well, pay special attention. Our guest today did. His mission from a young age has been to tackle these questions, and space is his beat. Astronomer Abraham Loeb, he invites us to call him Avi. He's the Frank B. Baird Jr. Professor of Science at the Harvard Astronomy Department and the director of the Institute for Theory and Computation at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics and the founding director of the Black Hole Initiative for Harvard Faculty of Arts and Sciences and has served on several other boards, including the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology in DC and the Physics and Astronomy Board of the National Academy. She can hardly be more credentialed. And five years ago, when a curious object took a brief stroll through our inner solar system before quickly departing again, astronomers could not readily identify it by conventional means. So the hypothesis started to roll in. Avi is here to share the story of his own answer, his own hypothesis, when applying rigorous curiosity when following where the evidence leads, and when daring to call it like he sees it. It would be arrogant to assume that we are alone in the universe, he reminds us, and stirred up a bit of controversy along the way. It resulted in his book, Extraterrestrial, The First Sign of Intelligent Life Beyond Earth, and The Galileo Project, which he named for that other daring scientist whose work jump-started a rather cataclysmic shift in our worldview some few centuries ago, an all-too-rare breed. Uh, let's welcome Avi Loeb. So, Avi, not a bad mission in life to seek answers to those big, big questions. Well, thank you so, <clears throat> so much for having me. Um, well. The way I see science is as a privilege of maintaining your childhood curiosity. And I haven't changed much uh, since I was a kid. Uh, I was for, uh, born on a farm. So you can think of me as a farm boy. All the labels that you mentioned are not very significant uh, as far as I'm concerned. And one vivid memory that I have from my childhood was sitting at dinner and asking a difficult question. And the adults in the room would pretend that they know the answer. 
And they, it was obvious that they don't know, <clears throat> they don't know as much as they claim to know. Uh, and that was the good situation. Uh, a worse situation was when the adults in the room would dismiss the question simply because they didn't know the answer. And I thought that be by becoming a scientist, I would uh, actually be surrounded by colleagues who maintain their childhood curiosity, who do not uh, behave that way. But uh, after getting tenured at Harvard and being the, the chair of the astronomy department for nine years, I'm really surprised to see that uh, I have exactly the same experience where people, <laughs> uh, people uh, pretend that they know much more than they actually know uh, and also dismiss a question just because they don't know the answer. And these are scientists. These are people that have tenure and therefore have no um, worries about job security. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I wrote this book, uh, Extraterrestrial. It was published seven months ago. And uh, since then, I mean, it was translated to 25 languages. And I had about uh, 1,250 interviews uh, over the past seven months. And uh, one question that kept coming back again and again was, why do you think there is this pushback to discussing the possibility of a, an advanced extraterrestrial civilization among the scientific community? What, what's the issue? What, why do people resist it? There has to be deep psychological issues underpinning <laughs> that one, I would think. Right? Well, it, uh, it actually took me seven months to figure it out. Uh, I was asked this question again and again, and um, a week ago, I published an essay in uh, Medium that uh, uh, basically summarizes my question, my answer to this question. And um, the way I see it is that our ego is the source of all evil. I mean, it's the source of evil in human history. It's a source of evil in uh, our daily deliberations. Uh, but uh, also in the context of scientific knowledge, because, um, well, first there is the superficial level of scientists being jealous of any publicity given to discussion on a specific topic. So they try to kill it so that there will not be any discussion on it. But that's very superficial. That's just jealousy, you know, personal jealousy. Uh, but uh, more fundamentally in this context of extraterrestrial uh, civilizations and the public cares a lot about this question. The point is that Throughout human history, we've been uh, arguing that we have a central role, you know, a central place in the universe. We first thought that we are at the center of the universe. That's what the ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle argued, and people believed him for a thousand years because it flattered their ego. And uh, it's sort of natural, you know, we are born into this world like actors put on a stage, and we tend to think that the play is about us. <laughs> Uh, and uh, well when said. I looked at when I looked at my daughters when they were young, you know, they thought that they are at the center of the universe. Uh, and then when I took them to the kindergarten, they obviously realized that that's not the case. Uh, and uh, it's a bigger uh, world out there. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, unfortunately, a lot of adults and human civilization as a whole hasn't matured yet. And the way to mature is by meeting others, so to speak. But um, uh, so even, <laughs> even beyond the feeling that we are the center, I mean, obviously Copernicus and uh, Galileo realized that no, the earth moves around the sun. And the response of the philosophers during the days of Galileo was to say, no, the, the sun moves around the earth. We know that we don't want to look through your telescopes. And they put him in house arrest. Today, they would have canceled him on social media. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> They would take uh, away his Twitter. <laughs> yeah. And uh, they maintained their ignorance. Uh, but that didn't prevent the Earth from moving around the sun. And we know that for sure. And we use it when we design space missions right now. So the fact that it wasn't popular at the time of Galileo is completely irrelevant. You know, I'm not trying to be liked on Twitter when I do what I do. I don't care how many people subscribe to, to the ideas that I advocate. The point is, if reality is described by those ideas, eventually it will shape our future. And it doesn't really matter that the philosophers, who, who remembers those philosophers four Thank centuries you. ago? They're completely forgotten and they're completely irrelevant. At the time, they were sufficiently forceful to put Galileo in house arrest. He suffered from it, but that's it. The earth continued to move around the sun. And, um, and we so celebrate that, him today. 
And we, yeah. well, through the, uh, I called the project the Galileo project. And if he was alive, I would have made him a honorary member because we prefer within this project to find the answers by looking through telescopes. That's the big lesson from Galileo, not to assume that we know the answer in advance. And then, um, you know, we will talk about that, but like uh, uh, four months ago, there was an article um, published in Nature Astronomy magazine by a philosopher who claimed that he knows that the object that appeared near Earth called Oumuamua, that didn't look like a comet or an asteroid, he knows based on philosophical reasoning that it must be natural in origin, it's not artificial. And I thought to myself, haven't we learned something over the past four centuries, <laughs> you know, since Galileo? Apparently not. It's really difficult for people to recognize that, you know, it's evidence that should guide us rather than our prejudice. And unfortunately, that's within the scientific community. I'm not talking about people. Actually, people, the public in general is fascinated. Embracing it. Yeah. yeah. And there was even, you know, a, an Orthodox uh, Jewish uh, magazine in Brooklyn uh, that interviewed me and put it on a cover story. And, uh, and then um, a colleague of mine at Harvard said, it looks like the Orthodox are more open-minded than your colleagues. <laughs> um, so I so have to ask you, are the same forces that shut Galileo down, those same psychological forces protecting the turf of our worldview, current as it is, uh, are those at play here even today? Yes, because, uh, you know, imagine this Perseverance rover that we sent to Mars, okay? It, it's intended to find evidence for primitive life on the surface of Mars, okay? Not because intelligent Mars, life, primitive life. Primitive life. And, you know, we know that Mars early on uh, had conditions similar to the Earth. It had an atmosphere, so it could have had liquid water and life as we know it. So it's searching for signatures of that. And just imagine that the Perseverance rover will go around the surface and bump into the wreckage of some... Uh, <laughs> it's not uh, going to be able to recognize it. Yeah. Some uh, advanced spaceship that uh, represents technologies that we don't possess. Uh, that will be a blow to our ego. Uh, I mean, as far as we are concerned, in terms of physicists, my colleagues, you know, uh, when we developed physics over the past century, we, uh, that allowed us to feel superior relative to the material world because electrons, protons, they obey the laws of physics. We formulate these laws and they are sort of like servants. They follow the laws strictly. You know, when we formulate laws within society, a lot of people disobey them. We put them in prison. Some, some of them we don't. Uh, but uh, the point is, uh, it's quite remarkable that the physical reality obeys strictly as far as we know the laws of physics that we discover in our laboratory. Now, we can feel superior relative to these electrons and protons because we have free will. We can decide, you know, if someone would write an equation that would forecast how we behave, we will uh, disobey Define. this equation. We will, just do the, we will just do the opposite and then show that the equation doesn't work. But the electron has no choice, okay? It must follow Schrodinger's equation of quantum mechanics. So the point is, we feel superior relative to the material matter because we can, we have free choice. Then there is microbes, okay? We feel superior relative to microbes. You know, they don't have intelligence. We feel superior relative to animals. We eat them. We can do whatever, we, we can put them in cages. We can do whatever we want. So, and then comes the other level where we want to feel superior relative to other people, okay? And the best example is the Second World War where a group of people, uh, the Nazi regime, decided to feel superior relative to other people. They triggered the death of 75 million people. That was 3% of the world population in 1940. And uh, it's 20 times more than the number of deaths uh, triggered by the COVID-19 pandemic. Just think about it. A group of people wanting to feel superior killed 20 times more people than COVID-19 so far. And um, my point is, uh, it's all about the ego. It's all about the human ego. Uh, the fact that we are central to the universe, the fact that we feel superior relative to animals, the fact that we try to feel superior relative to other people, it's all about the ego. And that's a very deeply rooted uh, mm -hmm. conviction uh, that is difficult to break. And my point is, the universe is teaching us modesty. Okay, my colleagues did not get a lesson. 
They want to insist that we are the smartest kid on the block. There is nothing like us. We are the pinnacle of creation unless you show us extraordinary evidence. In the words of Neil deGrasse Tyson, unless an extraterrestrial alien comes and has dinner with me, like who cares about him? Who cares about us? Like, why should we be so interesting to them? Why would they, you know, there is this uh, Fermi paradox that was formulated 70 years ago by Enrico Fermi. And he said, he was in Los Alamos at the time, not far from where you are. Uh, and he said, where is everybody? Where is every, as if, you know, that's very presumptuous. As if you sit in your, in, in, in your home and you lie down on the couch and you say, mm, nobody is knocking on my door. Therefore, I don't have any neighbors. Uh, where is everybody? Why don't they have party in, a, in, in our backyard? Well, that's <laughs> presumptuous. First of all, documented. And why aren't I the guest of honor to that party? Right. Yeah. So. I mean, the point is that, you know, we, we have recorded history by humans of only 10,000 years. That's one millionth of the age of the solar system. Like uh, they could have visited us a million years ago. Nobody would have noticed. A billion years ago, there were only microbes. Like, why would we think that if we right now don't hear a knock on the door, um, then we don't have neighbors? And by the way, if we don't look through our windows, our neighbors will not go away. So, you know, we keep <laughs> thinking all the time that the play is about us. My point is, you know, the play has been going on for 13.8 billion years since the Big Bang. Mm -hmm. We just came at the end. It's definitely not about us. Forget about it. Forget about your ego and yeah. think modestly about the universe. That's my message. Well, <laughs> if we are the only ones, if we're the only life in the universe, then we are that anomaly that we should be looking at, right? And chances are we're not. But well, but, but I don't think but we are. Everybody's because... looking at exoplanets and we're looking at Europa and Ganymede for water. We're finding so many planets out there that can inhabit. We're looking. Um, what's the big deal about your proposal? And we have to get back to Oumuamua for those who, who aren't familiar with it. What well, is the big deal about your proposal? Why did it stir up so much controversy? Your, your hypothesis as to what it could be is just as logical based on the evidence as more logical than the manufactured ones, creating laws of physics or invented natural substances. Can you explain... Who, the, Take us back to October 19th, 2017, and tell us what spurred your interest. Yeah, I, I, I will do that, but just a footnote to what yeah. you said before, and that is, um, you know, when I teach my class uh, classes at Harvard, I usually tell the students, you know, half of you are below the median of the class. That's the statistics. Way, yeah, that, this is just statistics. It's a fact. Half yeah. of you are below the median. They have a hard time accepting that. They all want to belong to the top 5%. Yeah. Uh, and of course, not possible great, mathematically. With, with great <laughs> inflation. So uh, the lesson from that is, you know, if we think of ourselves as members of the class of intelligent civilizations in the Milky Way galaxy, we are probably somewhere in the middle of this bell-shaped curve. We are not the smartest kid on the block. Forget about it. Just, you know, don't think that we, <laughs> that, um, we are special and unique. That's my message. But anyway, coming back to October 19, 2017, uh, there was this object, the first object that came to the solar system from outside was noticed near Earth. Uh, it, it was discovered by the telescope um, PANSTARS in um, Maui, Hawaii, and was given the name Oumuamua, which is a scout in the Hawaiian language. And um, um, at first, astronomers said, Oh, yeah, probably it's a comet coming from another star. But then it didn't look like a comet. There was no cometary tail when it came close to the sun. A comet is just a uh, rock covered with ice. So when it warms up as it gets close to the sun, the ice uh, evaporates Aperized. and you, you end up with a cloud of dust and, and, and gas around the, the object. And there was nothing like it. We didn't see any cometary tail around Oumuamua. And actually, the Spitzer Space Telescope looked very deeply, didn't detect ev even traces of carbon-based molecules. So ev there were very tight limits on it definitely not being a comet. It's not a comet, period, uh, based on all the data that we collected. And then people said, okay, well, maybe it's an asteroid. It's just a rock without any ice on it. And uh, the, 
uh, as the object was tumbling every eight hours, the amount of sunlight reflected from it changed by a factor of 10. And that implied that it has a very extreme shape, that the area of the object we see on the sky is changing by a factor of 10. So it meant that it at least projected on the sky, it's 10 times longer than it is wide. But the best fit to the variation of light was that of a pancake-shaped object, flat object, um, disc-like, at the 90% confidence. And then it was pushed away from the sun by a force other than gravity, something else was pushing it. And since it was not evaporating, it couldn't have been the rocket effect. And uh, my only interpretation of it was that it may be just the reflection of sunlight that is pushing it, uh, because the force that was acting on it declined inversely with distance squared in, in a smooth fashion. And in order for that to be effective, for sunlight to be effective at pushing it, it had to be very thin. Uh, like a sail. And in, in uh, September 2020, there was another object that exhibited a push away from the sun with no cometary tail, given the name uh, 2020 SO. It was discovered by the same telescope. And then the astronomers who discovered it realized, oh, it actually came from Earth. Uh, if you tr uh, extrapolate the trajectory back in time, uh, mm -hmm. it's a rocket booster that we launched uh, in a lunar lander mission. And it had very thin walls. That's why it has a large area for its mass. And uh, it was pushed as a result of reflecting sunlight. And uh, we know that we produce this object artificially. The question is, who produced Oumuamua? And this is not a philosophical question, I argue. It's just a question of getting a megapixel image, a high resolution image of this object so that we can tell whether it's a natural object or an artificial object. But we didn't get a photo, did we? It, it... We could not, uh, from the distance, uh, uh, and given the telescopes we have on Earth, we could not uh, resolve it. It was the size of a football field, roughly at the fraction of the distance uh, of the Earth from the sun. So um, for, uh, for in order to get a high resolution image, uh, we need to send a spacecraft that will pass close to such an object. And we hope to find more in the future. And that's part of the Galileo project, trying to identify future objects that look like Oumuamua and then designing a space mission. Because, you know, they say a picture is worth a thousand words. In my case, a picture is worth 66,000 words, the number of words in my book, Exoterrestrial. <laughs> <laughs> um, a light sail would be what we would design to go send a probe out there. The laws of physics being the same across the universe, a light sail would make sense. Why, if we could design it, why not another advanced uh, alien technology? It would be logical, right? This is right. And uh, in fact, I would go beyond that and I would say, you know, we know that most of the stars formed billions of years before the sun. And we know that uh, the Earth-Sun system is not really special. Uh, based on the Kepler satellite, we now know that about half of the Sun-like stars have a planet the size of the Earth, roughly at the same separation. And so if you just combine these realizations, you, realize, you find that um, it's very likely that there was a civilization that predated us by a billion years. And you know we are developing artificial intelligence systems right now that drive cars and will make medical decisions uh, and eventually outsmart us. Uh, so you can imagine sending an AI system into space equipped with a 3D printer and it could repair its parts and it mm -hmm. could potentially reproduce itself. So if something like that was produced uh, a billion years ago, the entire galaxy could be filled with such uh, probes. And uh, whether we live in such a reality or not should be decided by evidence by looking at this. And I didn't have any agenda. I just you know, followed the evidence on this object and decided that it's very unusual. And uh, I just looked, uh, you know, there is a, 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 a large article in the, the Boston Magazine uh, uh, that will come out in the November issue. And they asked me to go back and check uh, uh, all the emails uh, that we had uh, when Umu Mua showed up. And, I noticed the first email that came out of the discovery team was this object is weird. 
Now, since then, they paddle, you know, they try to argue that it's natural, but all the scientists that try to explain Oumuamua, the weird properties, the anomalies of it, had to invoke something that we've never seen before, like a, a cloud of dust particles or a chunk of frozen hydrogen, pure hydrogen, or a chunk of frozen nitrogen, pure nitrogen. And all of these have problems. Uh, they would not survive the journey. And all of them contemplate something we've never seen before. So my point is really simple. If it's something we've never seen before, if that's the best explanation for a natural origin, then we should contemplate also the artificial origin as well. And uh, it's because it reminds me of, you know, a, a, a caveman that is faced with a, a cell phone and the caveman <laughs> based on his experience with rocks would argue, oh, the cell phone is just a rock of a type that I've never seen before. Just like the astronomers are saying, oh, Oumuamua is a rock of a type that we've never seen before. Hydrogen iceberg, nitrogen iceberg, cloud of dust particles. These are the explanations. And I say, well, this is just the beginning of a learning experience. Um, because if the caveman presses a button, he would realize that this uh, uh, cell phone uh, records his voice. And if he presses another button, it will record his image. And then it will become clear that this cell phone is not a rock. <laughs> well, there was no, um, I mean, if you have a light probe and a light sail and you're sending it out through the cosmos, that would explain the vast distances uh, because it could repair itself, as you mentioned, it would have uh, power. Um, it, it could actually reach some far distant uh, planets and galaxies. So wouldn't it want to send a signal back home? We didn't see a signal, but I would think that if you really were designing a probe, you wouldn't want the signal to be noticed when it was there uh, watching po possible life around a planet. It would go back into deep space and then send its signal. I would think yeah, so. I mean, you yeah, could explain it that way. And I was also wondering if you look at dark matter, you look at dark energy, you look at black holes, are there other laws of physics perhaps yet to be discovered within the 95% of the universe that we don't yet understand? So wouldn't those, those advanced civilizations perhaps have cracked the code of some of that? Our bandwidth of our technology, our sensory apparatus in our human bodies and our technology is so limited. So does that intrigue you? We, we have so little data on that. Are you applying the same rigorous curiosity and... Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, we have our science for about a century, okay? Uh, quantum mechanics was discovered a century ago. Uh, our theor the theory of gravity that Albert Einstein formulated was discovered uh, in uh, 1915, uh, 106 years ago. Um, so we have all of the understanding of physics is about 100 years or old, and we still have a lot of things we don't understand. What was yeah. there before the Big Bang? What is inside a black hole? What is the dark matter? What is the dark energy? Now, you might say, okay, these are curiosities, it may not affect fundamentally the way we perceive reality. Well, I don't know. I'm not sure because, you know, if you look, go back 120 years ago, you will find physicists saying, oh, we pretty much understand nature. We are done. There is not much more to discover. They were very distinguished uh, physicists, you know, that were members of the Academy of Science. Yeah. Importantly, they didn't pay attention to uh, the black body radiation, which ended up uh, uh, leading to the birth of quantum mechanics. Oh. Uh, they said, oh, there's just a few dark clouds of things we don't fully understand, like bl the black body radiation and some other things. It turns out that, you know, quantum mechanics was born and it was a complete revolution in the way we understand reality. And a lot of the devices we are currently using are based on quantum mechanics. It's the biggest industry that we can, you know, it had huge uh, commercial benefits and initially of course it was just a matter of scientific curiosity uh, but it turns out that the atoms that everything all the electronics we are using is based on quantum mechanics so my point is you know a century 120 years ago people thought oh there is not much more to discover in fact even at harvard the director of the harvard college observatory about 105 years ago was arguing Oh, there is no point. His name was Pickering. He was the director and said, there is no point in Harvard being part of the next generation of big telescopes because what can you learn? I mean, 
we already have a, a, a telescopes of roughly one meter, the height of a person. Uh, and you know, what is there more to learn? We already know that about, <laughs> about the sun, we know that other stars are just like the sun. Therefore, Harvard University should not invest in an, a, a bigger telescope because that will be just a waste of money and effort. That's yeah. what he decided, okay? <laughs> now, what happened as a result was that in Mount Wilson, uh, a, 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 there was an effort to establish the biggest telescope in the world. And then Edwin Hubble used that telescope to discover the universe is expanding. Forget about stars, you know, the sun and other stars are really boring. What really is exciting is to discover the universe that we live in, and it's expanding completely opposite to what Albert Einstein thought when he developed general relativity. He wanted the universe to be in a steady state, not expanding. So this discovery of the expanding universe was made with the Mount Wilson Observatory and Pickering resisted building a telescope on being partner in the telescope on Mount Wilson, okay? There was a telescope looking at the sun in Mount Wilson that belonged to the uh, Harvard College Observatory. So just to show you the narrow-mindedness that is very often characteristic of scientists. Uh, and uh, what is there to find? There is nothing, we pretty much know everything. Now, I claim that it's exactly the same situation now, but it's worse now because now as part of the mainstream of science, for example, in theoretical physics, you have a whole culture of physicists that give each other awards, prizes, uh, membership in honorary society based on ideas that are not testable at all during our lifetime, like extra dimensions, mm -hmm. like the multiverse, like the string theory landscape, like string theory as a whole, as a whole, string theory has no uh, um, prediction that can be tested by experiments within our lifetime as we know now, okay? Mm -hmm. And there is a whole population of people bragging that they are carrying forward the torch of physics and you will find popularizers of, of physics saying string theory is the frontier of physics. It's not the frontier because it's not testable. It's not making prediction. It's not putting any skin in the game such that we can rule it in or rule it out. But, but my point is, it's part of the mainstream. It's being embraced by the mainstream of physics. Whereas the discussion of whether we are the smartest kid on the block is pushed to the periphery. So that's my argument. My argument is, that the current priorities of science and academia are completely twisted. Now, it's not just a nuance. It's not just saying, oh, we should discuss a little more this subject. It's exactly 180 degrees of where it's supposed to be. The public is, uh, cares a lot about the question of whether we are alone, whether there is another civilization even more advanced than we are. The public funds science, yet scientists ridicule this possibility and say, only when we have extraordinary evidence, we will consider this. And my point is, you know, just think of the solar system like a mailbox, okay? Uh, and you say, I don't have any mail. I don't want to check my mailbox. You know, forget about <laughs> it and ridicule it. Now, yeah. I say, obviously, you will never have extraordinary evidence that you have mail unless you go to the mailbox, make an effort, and go to the mailbox, it. open it up and check it out. <laughs> How can you tell, you know, I need extraordinary evidence before even engaging in a discussion. You're waiting for that have. dinner invitation, yeah. yet you won't look and see where yeah. it might, might hang the, out. Yeah. So my point is, it's really important for the future of humanity, because imagine that we have a package in our mailbox that we haven't checked. It may carry a message. And if we don't open it up, okay, uh, it may affect our future. Sort of like a love letter that you find in the attic after its time has passed. You know, if you don't open it at the right time, it, it loses its relevance. So the point is, if we find evidence for a technology that will take us, you know, thousands of years to develop ourselves from a civilization that predated us already far more advanced than we are, or maybe not existent anymore, but just sent those probes out, it could affect our future. It, you know, this is a really important question. And how dare we push it to the side and at the same time talk about extra dimension, hallucinating about things that we haven't seen. At least here we're talking about, you know, 
evidence. We are, something that we are doing, we are sending out spacecraft. Mm -hmm. You know, we know that there are lots, tens of billions of planets like ours. It makes complete sense. It's it's just a matter of you know common sense to say, okay, we maybe we are not special. Let's check. You know, in the search for dark matter, there were hundreds of millions of dollars invested. And that's, we don't know what most of the matter in the universe is. And then people said, oh, it's that type of particle. And then they searched for it with hundreds of millions of dollars invested. And for 40 years, we haven't found the dark matter. It was a search in the dark. I have no complaint. That was part of the mainstream. But my point is, if now we start a search for technological equipment of other civilizations near Earth, and we invest hundreds of millions of dollars for 40 years, and we don't find anything, then in 40 years, we will be at exactly the same point as the search for dark matter is right now. And my point is, how can you ridicule this subject, push it to the sidelines, while at the same time conducting this search for dark matter that didn't provide anything? And the public cares a lot about this subject of search oh. for other civilization. So I find, you know, currently the discussion to be exactly in the opposite place of where it's supposed to be. And so the Galileo project is looking for that evidence, remnants, current, something technological, not SETI looking at for radio signals. You're looking for actual objects Physical. from right. a, from a technologically advanced civilization. How do you yeah. go about that? What is the mission? What is the hope? Yeah, so I should say that the search for radio signals for 70 years, it's just like trying to have a phone conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, and for that, you need the counterpart to be active at the time that you're having the conversation. But uh, it's possible that most civilizations that predated us are dead by now. They're not alive anymore after a billion years. And so we will never see them. And also, they might not uh, produce radio signals for communication. They might use some. Uh, we are already using cable you know, cables for communication rather than radio signals. So, you know, a century from now, we might not transmit much radio signals. So the point is, it makes much more sense to do archaeology in space, to search for relics that were left behind, because these would survive uh, longer than the senders. And that's what the Galileo project is all about. So we have two components to the Galileo project. And I should say this project started in July this year, when ah. a few, a few multi-billionaires showed up on the porch of my home, they were intrigued by my book, Extraterrestrial. They had questions about it. They were inspired by the vision. And so they decided to provide me with $2 million uh, in my research funds uh, to explore these questions. And uh, as, a, as a result of that, I said, OK, well, I don't need anything else. Um, and I can establish a research program that is purely scientific, uh, using the scientific method. And that's what the Galileo project is all about. We have uh, about 30 uh, distinguished astronomers uh, uh, and um, altogether about 80 people involved in the project. Um, 30 are in the research team. Um, and uh, uh, we are currently selecting instruments. And we have two main objectives. One is to find objects like Oumuamua that I mentioned before and to examine their nature, get better evidence, for example, by a flyby, taking a high resolution image or landing on such an object and pushing the buttons. Uh, the second is to look for unidentified aerial phenomena. These are UAP, uh, abbreviated UAP, that were mentioned in the report from the Office of the Director of National Intelligence to the Congress. Uh, on uh, June 25th uh, this year, 2021. Their uh, list of anomalous sightings. Yeah. Yeah. So the you know the the report mentioned 143 incidents where objects were identified. There were many of them were real objects because they were found by multiple instruments, whose nature is unclear. And that's an admission uh, by the government that it's not doing it, its job. You know that's an unusual admission saying you know we are supposed to figure out what flies in the sky above the US because it's a matter of national security. Nevertheless, there were at least 143 incidents of objects whose nature we don't understand because these objects do not seem to behave the way that the human made technologies behave. And they say, we don't know what they are, uh, you know, and, and then uh, of course it rests 
uh, this report rests on uh, uh, classified data uh, that uh, was not released to the public, but um, a number of um, highly reputable uh, uh, politicians that looked at the data, such as uh, former CIA directors, uh, Brennan and Woolsey, uh, former President Barack Obama, and, and also the head of NASA, Bill Nelson, uh, said that uh, you know it's a serious matter and it's time for the scientific community to engage. And of course, the scientists said, ah, oh, forget about it. They ridiculed it. Uh, and the, the matter was forgotten. But for me, you know, if the government, which is a very uh, conservative organization, comes forward and says there is something we don't understand, for me, it's it's a call for scientists to basically try and clear the fog and, and figure out what this thing is using the scientific method. Why should we worry about how many angels sit on the tip of a pin in 10 dimensions, like you find in the context of string theory? Instead, let's try and explain something the government is unable to explain. And by the way, in the process of this fishing expedition, we might find some something really unusual. And uh, uh, so what we are planning to do with the UAP is um, establish a, a network of um, telescope systems that include optical telescopes and the infrared sensors and radio sensors mm -hmm. that would um, um, track objects that look unusual. If we see a bird or we see a drone or we see an airplane, this would not be of interest. You know, I'm not a zoologist. I don't care about how a bird looks like, even though, so when I get the image of a bird, I will send it to anyone interested in, in zoology departments. And uh, <laughs> if, if it would look like a drone or an airplane, and you know, I'm sure that uh, that's, you know, if we read off the label made in China, made in, in Russia, I'm sure National it will- security <laughs> department. Some, some yeah. residents of Washington DC. And again, I, I find those as boring, any human made the technology as boring as a bird is, you know. Uh, for me, what, what's interesting is to look for something else, something unusual, and that's what the Galileo project will try to find. Um, we have an yeah. astrophysicist in the audience who will want to, uh, Tony, if you have some thoughts, he yes. also puts objects up in space. I think this is a good time to call on Tony Hall. Uh, astronomer yeah. at UNM. I have uh, Bob Woodruff visiting me. Bob designed all the instruments, almost all the instruments on Hubble and designed the James Webb Space Telescope. And Kepler. And the Kepler Telescope. I have the privilege to lead the polishing of all the mirrors for Webb and uh, was NASA's technologist for Terrestrial Planet Finder uh, back two decades ago. And uh, and am engaged in the largest the largest telescope that's being considered in the U.S. and Europe right now. So it's really refreshing to hear you. I want to first of all say thank you. You're, you're breaking ground, and I know how difficult this is. I could not do this. You have the wheelbase to do it, and uh, and how much I appreciate that you're doing this. Uh, uh, there are great capabilities. I saw a question saying maybe we don't have the technology to look. I, I think we do. It's a matter of money. It's a matter of priority. Uh, Bob and I have a couple of uh, projects being considered by the National Academy now for the decadal survey. We're, we're waiting to hear what they have to say in a few weeks. And waiting and waiting. <laughs> and waiting. waiting. It was supposed to have been out a year ago, but that's a whole <laughs> yeah. other story. Yeah. COVID might have something to do with that, as well as the delay of web. And the, the uh, delay by, the way, uh, by the way, I chaired the board on physics and astronomy that the uh, selected the people involved in the decadal uh, survey um, until well, you, did, you did a good job. I know Fiona well. I helped develop her her uh, new star project. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but anyway, I wanted simply to, to say, uh, first of all, appreciation. You're introducing many, many great questions. I've already ordered your book. Uh, and if you need any help on, on the optical or infrared side, uh, uh, you're looking at the right people here. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, thank you very much. You sh uh, just send me an email because um, we will be glad to add you to the research team if you're interested. Uh, and by the way, thank you so much for, for the support. And I should say, you know, just frankly, you know, um, uh, why am I willing to suffer all the pain? You know, I, I don't subscribe to social media, but I'm aware that there are lots of negative remarks being made on Twitter. And, you know, I don't care how many likes I have on Twitter. It's really a bigger question than any of us, you know, that 
it affects it will affect the future of humanity if we find you know one object that seems to be of extraterrestrial technological origin and uh, i think it's really important for us to search you know even even if we don't find anything you know at least uh, you know, that would be important information to figure out uh, rather than ridicule the subject and dismiss it and not engage in this search. Uh, and the reason I, I uh, am willing to go through all the pain, you know, is um, be uh, because um, when I was uh, 18 years old, I was drafted to the military. I grew up in Israel. And one thing I remember when uh, doing the paratrooper training was that um, sometimes, um, you know, it was said that sometimes a soldier has to put his body on the barbed wire so that others can pass through. And the way I think of this is that I want the young generation to be able to speak about this subject freely. And I just couldn't uh, give up in not allowing that. So I, I'm willing to suffer the pain so that the future generation uh, will be able to do that. And I, I should say there is a lot of enthusiasm from young people. And just two days ago, I got an email from Spain showing a high school teacher um, uh, discussing my book, Extraterrestrial, in front of a class. And, they, and the students, he told me that the students are really eager to buy the book. So it's, it clearly triggers a lot of interest from young people. And there is a potential of bringing more people to science and more funds to science. And I demonstrated it with the Galileo project. I got $2 million. We need about uh, 20 to make it happen. So if there are any wealthy individuals listening right now, you know, just let me know if you're willing to engage. But um, the point is, uh, this subject brings new funds and brings new talent into science. And I think it's a great opportunity. It's a win-win proposition. So I just don't understand the pushback and the negative reaction from the scientific community, because I think it's you know it's one of these uh, uh, subjects that will bring prosperity to science in the future. So rather than engage in uh, you know extra dimensions and questions that have no relevance, even the dark matter, you know, if we find the dark matter is a weakly interacting massive particle, that would have very little impact on the daily lives of people, except the people that will win the Nobel Prize for discovering that. <laughs> and, uh, uh, my point is, if we find that there is some piece of technological equipment that was sent by others, that would have a huge impact on the way we think, because it will change our philosophical and religious beliefs about our place in the universe. It will affect the way we plan our future. And so how can we shy away from this question, you know, given that we have the instruments to search right now? So... Uh, I very much hope that the discussion will change. And given that the government also is interested, um, and um, I, I think that the Galileo project has an interesting prospect here of finding something of interest. And of course, we will keep the data open and the analysis transparent so uh, the public will be able to follow what we find. I think Bob, I think Bob has yeah. a question for you yeah. here. The, the, the hardest part of science is determining which questions to ask. And, and that, you know, they, for instance, Hubble, the, 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 the Hubble telescope made observations and that, and that led us to what questions to ask. Dark energy did not exist before, before uh, it used the, the, the grism that I put in, in, in uh, the space telescope image spectrograph. Uh, so it is to, what are the questions? What are the questions? That is the hardest thing to come up with. Exactly. I completely agree with you, Bob. By the way, you must have uh, worked uh, together with uh, John Bacall. He was my first mentor in astrophysics. Well, I met him, I'm sure, but yeah. Yeah, but uh, you are completely right that, uh, um, you know, the questions we ask are shaped by what we know and the uh, uh, and, and we should be open-minded because otherwise uh, we, we will not open up a new territory. And, you know, our knowledge is just an island in an ocean of ignorance. Mm -hmm. uh, most, most things we don't know. And uh, perhaps by uh, encountering knowledge from another civilization, we would be able to recognize, you know, not only that we are not the smartest kid on the block, we'll realize that there is a, a better perspective. Uh, we, we will figure out the meaning of our life. I should say a week ago, there was a, I saw a, a person standing on the street looking at my home, at my house. And uh, I approached him. My wife said, who is this person? Why is he 
And I went there and I said, who are you? And he said that he lived in my home uh, half a century ago. And uh, then I invited him to look uh, at our backyard. And he told me that his father uh, buried a cat, uh, their first cat, uh, and put a tombstone. Uh, and the cat was called Tiger. And I said, where was the tombstone? He said, up in the hill here. And I said, okay, let's go and check. And we found the tombstone. So my point is, you know, uh, there may have been a lot of visitors uh, to the solar system in the past 10 billion years. And, you know, there, there is this concept that uh, the ancient Greeks embraced, which was the kindness of hospitality. It's called Sinia during the days of Homer that wrote the Iliad and, and, and wrote, uh, wrote, wrote uh, Odyssey. You know, uh, uh, the, the kindness of hospitality was very much uh, 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 respected and uh, in the Greek culture. And uh, we should have, you might think today it's outdated because there is flow of information uh, across the earth and you know you don't benefit much from a person visiting you from another country like the ancient Greeks you know I, I'm sure they valued hospitality because they could gain new information about distant locations but my point is we should embrace interstellar uh, senior or, or hospitality in the sense that we can learn a lot from knowledge provided to us by visitors not from our planet, but from <laughs> another place. And, you know, that's the way for us to grow. If you look at the uh, Greek uh, culture, you know, uh, it blossomed as a result, you know, its philosophy and literature blossomed as a result of visitors. And um, I would rather have the aliens, bef we befriend them than China. We learn from their technology first before the <laughs> other guy does. And I don't know why so many sci fi movies are all about let's blow them up. You don't think they have the capacity if yeah. they wanted you did, always, we, we wouldn't be here to ask the question. It's always yeah. warfare, yeah. So, if, I, if I could uh, just, just yeah. go, and that's an interesting topic, but I'm wondering to what extent the Eric von Donegan experience has helped or hurt you. Uh, I know that I was involved in a number of public discussions on that way back, and of course everything said was not, turned out not to be true there. Uh, what I really love is that you brought your credibility in as you said, put, put your, your body on the barbed wire. And uh, this helps me and it helps others in science that want to look at the world from a slightly different way. You're, you're opening up a crack in the armor and I love that. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, well, I think that Thanks. Eric von Danikan contacted me now. He wants to yeah. elevate yeah. his reputation by interview. So he interviewed me for an hour. Um, you know, I don't care about that. I remember his uh, book, uh, Chariots, of the gods. Yeah, uh, when I was a, a, a small child. And um, my point is, you know, there, there were lots of people saying lots of wrong things in the past. Uh, I have no problem with that. You know, it's just like uh, a thousand years ago, there were people saying that the human body has a soul and therefore anatomy should be forbidden because if you dissect the human body, you will hurt the soul. Now, imagine if scientists would say, oh, there is a lot of nonsense being said about the human body. It's a controversial subject. We don't want to deal with that. Where would modern medicine be if we didn't have operations? Uh, my point is, if scientists have the capability to address a subject like the human body, okay, as a physical object, trying to figure out what it's made of, forget about nonsense said by others. The human body has a soul, don't touch it. You know, just you know, without any fear, approaching reality and figuring out what it is. You know, I think it's really important for us to figure out the reality that we live in because it affects our future. It, it shapes our future. When we know that the earth moves around the sun, you know, by looking through our telescopes, then we can design space missions. When we know what the human body contains, then we can repair it. Uh, and if people say nonsense about the human body, about the solar system, it only delays progress. And for us to shape our future in a way that matches reality, we need this knowledge. 
and not be fearful of it, not being bullied on social media by people saying uh, uh, this is this subject should not be touched until we have extraordinary evidence. And it's not just the scientists, it's people that pretend that they are scientists. There are yeah. lots of people that publicize science, you know, they haven't written a paper, a scientific paper in, in the last decade or 15 years. You find lots of these people that are sort of public figures and they publicize the advances in science. And yet, you know, they try to argue that they are promoting the importance of science in society, but at the same time, they are blocking progress in science by basically attending to notions of the past without allowing a, 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 an open discussion on new frontiers. Right. And I can give you an example, like in, 2000, in January 2013, I gave a lecture at the winter school in Jerusalem about gravitational wave astrophysics. And that was an, a subject that was not discussed much. And I said, gravitational waves are really important. And then within 10 minutes into my lecture, another lecturer, 20 years younger than I am. So it has nothing to do with age. This guy stood up and it's all video recorded. Uh, he said, how dare you waste the time of these students on a subject that will not be important throughout their career. Now, this young guy is telling me, a tenured professor at Harvard, what to speak about. Like, how is that possible? I felt really, you know, I, I felt bad, frustrated by that. So, but then the thing is that in August or September 2015, just two and a half years later, the LIGO observatory discovered the first gravitational wave source. And these students were still doing their PhD. So I'm not talking about their career. While they're still doing their PhD, gravitational wave astrophysics came to the forefront and it became the most exciting frontier in astrophysics. And then the Nobel Prize was awarded a few years later. Now, if you go to this young guy that stood up and basically bullied me in front of the students, if you go to him and say, why did you make that comment? Do you think you, he would say, what comment? What are you talking about? Of course, gravitational wave astrophysics. Yeah, it's uh, completely reasonable. And in fact, I think, you know, a lot of people said that before Avi and I have no problem with that. Yeah, of, of course. Um, so what will happen is this front, and I've seen it many times again, um, this frontier of searching for other civilizations. Once we find the evidence, and by the way, without searching, we will not find it. So that's a like a circular argument the community is using, but I'm breaking this ice. I'm, I created the Galileo project. If we find evidence, then people would say, oh, of course, since the 19th, this is not new. Since the 1960s, <laughs> we knew it all along. a lot of us were saying that, a yes. lot of us were talking about it. There is nothing new about it. The, this is not their subject. This is not their discovery. In fact, it was well known. There is nothing really important about it. So we want to introduce I, another uh, astronomer, Sherilyn Morrow. We got to give women their due as well. So she has a couple of comments and questions. Hi, uh, Sherilyn. Welcome. Yes. Uh, I don't know about that introduction, but OK. Um, uh, yes, Dr. Loeb, thank you for your your willingness to um, Put yourself out there. You're in a position to do it like no other. Uh, and I, I think there's some other social science lessons, perhaps, to learn from history, Galileo in particular. Um, I think I appreciate your critique of the scientific community, which is why I spend, after a PhD in solar physics, I spend time at the interface between public outreach and, and the research community. Right, And so I'm one of those people who wants to translate science to to the public and to learners and young people. Um, when I look at the Galileo story, I see, you know, a, a, a real lesson of incivility, right? I mean, uh, it's, it's, and in fact, a persecution of a person by those in power for public outreach, as much as for you know, doing science. I mean, the Jesuits of the day did science, right? And it's a question of whether you shared it or not, um, right, with the public. Because as you say, there is a public fascination, right, with this, with this topic. It's really ingrained uh, in us. And so 
I, I do think that there's a scientific foundation for revisiting this question anew between the, the unidentified aerial phenomenon uh, and the legitimization of that now and the Kepler discoveries, the change of our sense of probability of inhabitable worlds, um, Oumuamua, right? There, there is an object, there is an object that visited our solar system, whether it's natural or um, made by extraterrestrials. And by the way, I appreciate your use of extraterrestrial instead of alien, right? Alien to what? We're all living in this universe, in this, you know, this galaxy, this, you know, where it's, it's not about alien. I, I, I hesitate to, we, we call aliens the people who come across our borders. I mean, it's, I don't, I think like a cosmic person, you know, I mean, alien to what? So extraterrestrial off the earth is powerful. And even if your effort is to get uh, a, a, to, if you get a null result, that's still significant. Right. And so I, I scientifically, I find what your pursuit very strongly uh, credible from the lessons of you're, you're, you're considering alternative hypotheses. Right. Now, just I guess get to get you said ego. Ego is the source of evil. Well, yes. But isn't it natural in the spirit of civility? Right. You, you, you are in a certain sense untouchable given your credentials. Right. You, you, right, so you can do this. And so your reaction to the heat, right, of a community that operates not out of fear. I spent time in academia. It's a very fear-based culture, right? Oh, am I going to get tenure? Oh, am I, you know, and that somebody's going to- Am I going to get published? Yeah. Make, make me look bad, you know, publish your parent. The creative ideas or even good teaching are suppressed in the name of getting a certain number. You know, the, the academic culture does have some sicknesses and some weaknesses that are manifesting in this case. You know what they are, you, you live them. So it's maybe, I'm just wondering if recognizing that it is the impulse of our academics to want to have a natural explanation, right? I mean, I wanna pursue that to its utmost to have a natural explanation for this phenomenon because of all the the junk science or the pseudoscience that's been along with this topic, people are afraid and they're afraid of their reputations, right? So there's a fear in this. And I just wonder if you could comment that on that a little bit. And because you are fairly untouchable, your involvement with the Academy, your chairmanship of the Harvard Astrophysics Department, it's like you could, it's, it's like not reacting, you know, in a way that discredits you. But I want to give one example. I have leading edge climate scientists, right, pursuing their science and they get attacked, right? And then they react to that attack in a way that's entrenched, that makes them look less scientifically credible. You see, and there's so there's a peril here, right, that I just wonder if you could comment on that edge and if you're pondering things in, in that way. Thank yeah, you. you're exactly correct. I mean, everything you said, I completely resonate with, uh, Shuni. Uh, I should say, but I, I should tell you that uh, the reason I'm doing what I'm doing is because I don't think the current discourse in academia is a healthy discourse. And let me give you an example. Um, so there was this nitrogen iceberg model for Oumuamua, basically saying it's a uh, it's a chunk of frozen nitrogen that was chipped off the surface of a planet like Pluto around another star. And then I discussed it with my student, Amir Siraj, who is an undergraduate, 21 years old. And we just uh, went through some numbers and concluded that this model is not tenable. Uh, there is not enough nitrogen in the Milky Way galaxy to produce enough chips, okay? And um, we wrote a, a paper demonstrating that through a very simple calculation submitted it to a journal. Now, what did the editors of the journal do? They sent the paper to a referee who is one of the proposers of the nit nitrogen model. Now, what uh, there couldn't be more of a conflict of interest than that because this person wants his model to be right. So basically he argued that our paper should not be published, okay? And then what the editors did was consult among themselves with two other editors and decide to reject the paper without allowing us to respond to the referee. So I said to the chief, I wrote to the chief editor and said, 
you know, this is like a totalitarian regime, you know, in any civilized society, if something is, any comment is made for, uh, against you in, in the courtroom, you are allowed to respond to that. You are allowed to explain your point of view. That was not given to us, this privilege of explaining why we have, and by the way, it's all simple math. It's not as if we were arguing just based on philosophical reasoning. We were just doing a calculation demonstrating this model doesn't work. And then the strange thing is another group of people published a paper in another journal that was accepted for publication saying exactly the same thing, okay? And then when we submitted our paper to another journal, it was refereed by someone who was not involved. And, you know, we just received minor comments and hopefully the paper will get accepted. Uh -huh. Now, what's the moral of the story? That it's not just uh, people proposing the model, but there is a lot of wishful thinking. Uh, the editors of that journal, which is quite prestigious, want the natural origin to be valid and they want to suppress the any argument that shows that a natural model is not the valid uh, a valid model and uh just to give you another example in this context there was a nature paper nature very prestigious magazine a group of people came together and said omuamua is natural period and they just came together a large group of people then a few months later uh an, an, an independent team said actually it's it must be a hydrogen model uh, a hydrogen uh, a, 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 a iceberg a chunk of frozen hydrogen that would explain the anomalies and then there was a problem with the hydrogen model because it would evaporate uh, very quickly and so the, there was another suggestion a few months later by another team saying oh maybe it's a dust bunny a cloud of dust particles and then a few months later maybe it's a nitrogen model now my point is if it was obvious to the original group of people that wrote the nature paper that it's natural, why didn't you say that it's a hydrogen iceberg? Why didn't you say it's a nitrogen iceberg? Why didn't you say it's a chunk, you know, it's, it's a cloud of dust particles? So my point is, they want it to be natural no matter what. That's, you know, that's the truth. Uh, because that's propaganda I, then that's a that's upholding a pre-gone conclusion and that's not following the scientific method it exactly. would seem and, to and, me and my point is well scientists scientists should be open-minded blue sky you know in nine in the early 1930s there was a book written about the special theory of relativity by, by albert einstein and there were a hundred authors arguing against einstein's theory and when einstein was asked about it he said why do you need a hundred authors? It's sufficient to have one that has a valid argument. Yes, now, it's not Michael, a majority. It's not a majority. Right? It's not it's a matter I... of uh, popularity. You know, it's not like um, uh, Twitter or... So the point is that uh, there is this tendency of having a group think, of, uh, you know, building up a herd such that you put enough pressure, social pressure, you know, bullying, against competing ideas such that you prevail but that's not the way that and how is the dust cloud shiny how does that fit the evidence the idea of the dust bunny was that it's a hundred times it's a cloud of dust particles a hundred times less dense than air so it's sort of like a feather and then when it reflects sunlight it's getting pushed that was the idea that it's so porous oh. you know uh, but the problem with that is when it gets close to the sun, it will get heated by hundreds of degrees and then it will not maintain its integrity. That's my problem with this. Um, so altogether, you know, all the suggestions were of something we've never seen before. We've never seen a dust bunny. We've never seen a nitrogen iceberg. We've never seen a hydrogen iceberg. We don't know if nature produces these things at large abundance such that the first object we see from outer space is unusual. You know, we see objects within our solar system, they look like rocks. Now you are saying, oh, there is a factory that makes hydrogen icebergs, or there is another uh, nursery that makes nitrogen icebergs at a much larger rate than the rocks we see in the solar system. You know, that's an unusual proposition. That's something we've, how can you argue, yes, it must be natural and suppress any competing explanation? My point is the scientific community is supposed to be more tolerant towards ADN. And it's really important because, uh, you know, the, the way it should be decided is by evidence, not by uh, a, 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 a group thing. And, um, and if, you, if you argue that it's natural no matter what, 
then you say, I don't really need evidence. It's not really interesting. You know, let's move on to consider other subjects because we pretty much decided it's natural. And that is laziness. That's just say, saying, we don't want to explore something that we haven't thought about before. And I have a problem with that because how can we ever realize that we miss something really fundamental? The only way to figure it out is by searching for evidence. So we are searching for evidence of the content of the dark matter, but we are not searching for evidence of equipment that came from other civilizations. That to me is a, a shortcoming of, of, of modern science. And I'm trying to suggest that, but I'm, you know, I get a lot of pushback and I don't understand it. And I'm, I'm and by the way, the pushback is coming also from the SETI community. That's the other interesting thing. Oh, okay. Tell us about that because that's interesting. That's, that's amazing. That I find really amazing because for 70 years, there is a community of people that was trying to search for radio signals, laser signals. They got very little funding. Okay. They got really minuscule funding <laughs> at the level of 1% or less of what the dark matter searches are getting, okay? And without so, trying, you get a couple million dollars at your doorstep. So I can imagine yeah. that would stir up some, yeah. Now, the strange thing is they don't want to make the rest of the community upset. It's like someone that was not treated right, you know? You, you often find those people that are not treated right, and then they are afraid of making those people that don't treat them right upset, just to preserve what uh, they have. Interesting. So they Say, oh, there is no problem. Uh, the community is okay. Why are you saying these things? So they are also opposing me. And I say to them, I say, why don't you join me? You know, why don't you advocate for this in a way that is courageous, in a way that says the right things? And they say, oh, you shouldn't say these things about the community. There is actually enough attention to this. Now I say, what, what do you mean by attention? That there is very little funding. You know, there is funding at the level of less than a percent or 0.1% or of the funding for the dark matter search for anything else. You know, for primitive life, there is a funding that is a thousand times more. Um, so just to give you an example, the astronomy community with a decadal survey is designing future telescopes that will try to find evidence for uh, uh, oxygen or methane in the atmospheres of exoplanets. And I say, if you find oxygen, it will not tell you whether there is life on those exoplanets because the earth didn't have oxygen for the first 2 billion years. So mm -hmm. for half of its life, the earth didn't have much oxygen, even though it had life, it had microbial life on the surface, there was not much oxygen in the atmosphere. So if you don't find oxygen on another planet like the earth, you don't know if there is my, uh, microbial life or not, because the earth is an example where it was, there was life, but there wasn't oxygen. Now, if you do find oxygen, it doesn't really tell you that there is life because you can get oxygen from natural sources. So it, it becomes a very murky business where you're not sure if, so even if you invest these billions of dollars in building these instruments, you will not know for sure just by discovering oxygen in the atmosphere of planet, which is a huge challenge. You would not be sure if there is primitive life. I say something different. I say with the same instruments, you can search for industrial pollution in the same atmosphere. Ah. And if you find CFCs, you know, these pollutants that we produce with our industries. Not natural. Yeah. If you find it, then it will not only demonstrate that there is life because nature doesn't produce these molecules. You know, these are two very complex molecules and they have fingerprints that we can identify. I say, if we find them, we will know that there is intelligent life, not just and that would be conclusive because nature doesn't make these molecules. It's so, also arrogant to think that life is going to use the same biochemistry as us. We know other life ex extremophiles. We know that there's life using a lot of different chemistry. That's so, right. And, and uh, there is a fundamental question of how to search for life as we don't know it. Ah, but, my point, but my point is that if you search for intelligent in industrial life, you know, it might be a more conclusive signature that you can find. And why not put it in the same proposal for a spectrograph that will search for molecules in the atmosphere of a planet? Why not put the motivation of searching also for industrial? Proof? You will not find it. It's ridiculed. The subject is pushed to the sidelines. 
And because it's accepted to discuss primitive life, once again, I think it boils down to the ego. We can feel superior relative to, and why would we even contemplate intelligent life if we don't have extraordinary evidence? My point is you are building these instruments for billions of dollars, mm -hmm. you know, uh, let's allow ourselves to discover intelligent life with them. You know, why say I need extraordinary evidence be before even mentioning the search for intelligent life in my proposals. That to me makes no sense whatsoever. Well, we also have to look at what are the artifacts that we're going to leave behind that the archeologist of the future maybe spread across the cosmos will eventually find. We're going to be part of that alien technology that someday something will find. We are yeah. the answer to that, that question itself. So, That's yeah. Right. And uh, if we exist, you know, and, and if we like, exist, we who can... wants to be a fluke? I think it's more enchanting and more glorious and a safer stance in the universe to think that it's it's a cosmic womb of life. It's yeah, a creative but, uh, fecund womb of life, and we're I... just a part of it. Then that we're a fluke, and it also puts so much pressure on us. If we blow, by the way, Earth will have the last laugh here. We are not going to conquer climate change and and uh, the vague Earth has been around a lot longer than we are going to survive. I, I yeah. should uh, um, echo what you just said and and and, and, and say that um, you know if you open a recipe book for cakes, what's the chance that you will stumble across the page? You just open a random page in the book. What's the chance that it will be the best cake possible? So if you, you know, you look at the earth and there was a soup of chemicals that led to our existence, what's the chance that we are at the pinnacle of creation? Like, it's very small. I'm sure that, you know, there are other planets where the circumstances were slightly different. These chemicals were yeah. mixed differently and they ended up making much better cakes in terms of intelligence than we are. So to me, it makes more sense to assume that we are relatively mediocre. But, you know, and if you look at human history, you know, the way I define intelligence is a civilization that follows the guiding principles of science. And those mean um, sharing of evidence based knowledge. And if you look at human history, you see that humans did not throughout history did not share much, you know, with each other. If, you know, even in the context of COVID-19, the uh, that was discovered in Wuhan, China, uh, the Chinese government didn't uh, release the information to the rest of the world when, when the virus yeah. uh, came out. And, and obviously it would have saved lives and would have helped develop the vaccine right. earlier. So we don't share information. And moreover, policy decisions are not based on evidence very often. So I would argue we are not intelligent. We are not We're sharing. still in the dark ages, aren't we? Yeah, I would, that's what yeah. I would argue. Yeah. Yeah. I would like to eject um, a, a positive note um, before we run out of time. Uh, the naming of Oumuamua was an extraordinary process that involved indigenous people, indigenous Hawaiian people in collaboration with its discoverers. And it was a mark of hope, I think, for our civilization, which uh, I uh, grant you, I'm not in academia for a lot of reasons you're describing. <laughs> and so I, you know, I feel like this naming process actually actively reached out to the Imaloa Science Center and an informal education institution that had a connection with the neighboring community or university, um, actually it was a college, right, in Hilo, Hawaii. And there was a linguistic professor who engaged his students in a process of conversation with the scientists to learn about the nature, because a naming for an indigenous culture is a really important and sacred act, right? It's a very, you need to understand all about it and what it's doing and how we are interacting with it. I find it significant that they named it something that we interpret as scout. The messenger who arrived first, I think. Yeah, the messenger think, from afar who arrived first. It's very beautiful. I completely it? agree with you, uh, Sherlyn. Uh, this is remarkable that um, they came up with this name. And uh, also the fact, you know, there is a long tradition there. And um, this is something to point out uh, as we celebrate the Indigenous uh, People's uh, Day uh, tomorrow. And uh, the other thing I should say that is yesterday I re received an email from uh, a Canadian uh, woman uh, who is uh, 
indigenous, uh, from an indigenous origin. And she was extremely excited about uh, uh, the Galileo project. And uh, I, I invited her to be involved and uh, she will be part of it. And uh, I, I, you know, sometimes I feel that the people who uh, are claiming to be the, the carriers of the torture, uh, of the um, torch of progress, uh, you know, and, and, and the carriers of uh, advances in, in our um, knowledge are really not really uh, leading us. They are behind and uh, they just, um, you know, put a lot of makeup, but they are not really the ones that are open-minded. And sometimes the people that claim that they're promoting science are damaging it more than uh, promote it. And well, you know, and I yes, may I inject? I feel like this is an extraordinary. And I noticed you have a very, you have a strong outreach team because you under you clearly understand from your website that you have to, right? And Sadi knew this too. I my hope is that eventually you will become allies. You know, they got cowed and suppressed. You know, and leaving that door open to an alliance where they can reinvest in their enthusiasm, yeah. you know, right, to the search for extraterrestrial technology, as it were. Making um, it legitimate, making it exciting, making it fundable. Making well, it and this is the thing, from an outreach point of view, this is an extraordinary laboratory for teaching people about the nature of science, the nature of scientific inquiry, because you're taking on and in the domain like, you know, sun weather connect, you know, so, uh, sunspots or something, right? A solar activity uh, linked to the, to the climate, you know, that have these knee jerk reactions because there's been so much pseudoscience. You can understand it, I think, Dr. Loeb, you can, yeah. right? I mean, this is understandable. It's not nice, but it is understandable. And I think if we understand why this controversy gets excited, then we can get kind of meta on it. Right, yeah. and, and navigate it, yeah, yeah. in a- Good point, skillful. Sherilyn, thank you. Yeah. I, I should say that the, you know, the public has its heart in the right place. And the criticism that I have is mostly with the scientific community. And you know, I think uh, science should not be boring. There is no reason. I mean, the only reason that some scientists uh, uh, promote boring science is in order to promote their self-image and get awards, right. honors, and so forth. I mean, that's not what science is about. Science is figuring out the world. It's not about us. It's not about the uh, highlighting our ego and so forth. And, you know, that's, uh, once again, we come back to this ego. I think it's really the, the source of all evil. Or fear, anyway, right? Oh, and the, and yeah. the ego causes us that fear oh, of our reputation. Yeah, I, forgot, I forgot to comment on, on that aspect because you brought it up. Uh, I get a lot of emails from young people who say to me, we completely agree with you, but we are worried about getting engaged in this subject because of our job prospects, because yes. our senior people that are bullying, you know, anyone discussing it. And I think that's a much worse, actually, uh, damage that is done to science where its uh, innovation is being suppressed by, and of course, you know, if you were to come to Marie Antoinette and propose the principles of the French Revolution, she would not listen to it because she benefited from the old system, right? Uh, and the, yeah. the people that are in senior positions right now, they basically are benefiting mm. from the current system. They would resist any change. Uh, I really believe in the young generation making the difference and that's the audience that they speak to. And I think um, it's so important to stand up to the bullying in life, in high school, now <laughs> in science, and it takes somebody with your credentials, um, your Teflon shield to, to do it. And so thank you for being that, that hero and that voice. And I remember what I wanted to say earlier, we know we're in the dark age when we are um, destroying our planet and not even knowing if we can exist and where the billionaires that are promoting space travel are doing so to give humanity a chance so we can go to some other planet after we trash this one. That's the dark ages. We need to get humble. We need to understand our place in the universe. We need to ask these questions. We need to befriend the universe at large. We need to understand who and what we are. And I want to thank you, Sherilyn, for all the social. It's great to hear from you, Tony and Bob. Scientists are in the trenches 
judges who have been faced with the kind of censorship and the inquisition that's still alive. I appreciate all your comments and perspective for Avi. But I also want to turn to Christine uh, Van Poole, our favorite anthropologist, because there's an anthropological aspect to all of this as well. And this is that ancient cultures, Avi, embraced their position on the web of life. Um, as co-equals with all other creatures, ancient civilization had no problem with looking at the universe and saying it's probably replete with life. And I want Christine to back me up there and comment. <laughs> Thank you. Christine teaches at the University of Missouri, teaches yeah, anthropology. Before we get to Christine, if I yeah. can just make yes. a, a comment. Um, you know, uh, I think the current wealthy individuals that are going to... Uh, in yes, thank you. You know, like... Uh, um, uh, like uh, Jeff Bezos or, or um, Elon. Uh, Elon, Elon Musk, or, or um, 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 uh, oh. uh, Richard Branson. Branson. Uh, yeah. you know, they, they were uh, basically using their wealth to lift their body by one percent of the Earth radius in recent months. You know, and it's really not very um, significant. significant. Yeah, uh, because I mean. They were trying to show off, but in fact, the universe is 10 to the power 19 times bigger than uh, the Earth radius. And, you know, showing off in space is an oxymoron. And um, I think they were driven to do these things for the wrong reason. Um, they are not trying to uh, explore out of humility what uh, is out there. They are really trying to show off. And I would say it's the wrong motivation. You know, either commercial or showing off is not the right motivation for going to space. And space is really vast. So, uh, yes, uh, I'll be glad now to, to listen to the anthropology. <laughs> <laughs> It's really a study of us, isn't it? And our place in the universe. Yeah, you know, the who are we? Where did we come from? Where are we going? What's it all about? Those are the age old questions. And this is a new chapter when we can actually apply these kinds of technologies to answer that. Space archaeology, space, space anthropology. This is a whole nother yeah. avenue. Yeah. Yeah. But hi, Christine. Hi. Um, wonderful presentation. Um, being at the University of Missouri in the Department of Anthropology, I definitely a lot of the same things you feel within the field of science and peer review is always a mixed bag for me. Sometimes it, I get the right reviewers and everything's substantially improved. And other times I can't get something published because of dogma or something like that. But that being said, I, I think it's fascinating, fascinating to think about ET, what that might look like in the cosmo. And if they'd been here, how could we as archaeologists um, understand us? A game I played for a very long time. I had a very open-minded father that we were able to play with these issues. So sometimes I, I think about those artifacts, those features, those buildings, what might have been left. And I don't have any answers, but it's a fun exercise. But what I do have answers for, maybe sometimes, is what artifacts look like that are created by intelligence and design versus things that prior natural are maybe chaotic. So if it's too chaotic, we in science, it's really hard to deal with chaos. But anyway, just some some thoughts. And I think it's absolutely fascinating what you are doing. And I, I hope to hear more from you in the future. And maybe we'll get lucky and you'll find some features and buildings and a remote parts of our galaxy. And we can learn more about this great cosmos that we call home. Beautiful. In a mythopoetic way, our ancestors have always embraced the universe at large. They sat there every it's night the around the campfire looking at and bedazzled by the night sky and the 6,000 visible stars that are out there. And um, we are losing that. Um, we, are, we are, with light pollution, with all the stuff we're putting up in space. I mean, I've seen in the Australian outback, I've seen in Bryce Canyon, I've seen on Maui. Uh, I know so many of us have, oh, just, been in awe from the night sky. This is what our ancestors embraced um, philosophically and culturally and um, just in in terms of a warm embrace of the universe. They embraced it. I, and should, I, say, think that I, I should say in this context, uh, I should quote uh, Oscar Wilde, who said, uh, we are all in the gutter, but some of us are looking at the stars. <laughs> Beautifully put. <laughs> Yes. And, uh, unfortunately, a lot of people just focus on the gutter. I mean, that's what you read in the morning news every day. Yeah, thank you. Can I add one thing? 
please. One thing I love about ancient people is they're always looking to the cosmos, looking to the sky, and they reached up, they grabbed it, and they tried to bring it down. We see that in architecture. Thank you. We see that in rock art. We see that in building constructions. I'm teaching ancient Mesoamerica, and I'm always just enchanted with the ancient astronomers of the Maya, how much they knew, how much they were able to perceive, how much they were able to bring it down. And so I think whoever we are as a human species, I think we're looking up all the time. And I think we want to understand ourselves by looking up. And I think it's an, an incredibly important thing to do. Yeah. So, yes. one, one comment I wanted to make about- In Lascaux, Mars. you can see star charts. <laughs> Absolutely. In, in the Hall of Bulls, star charts. There's so much good evidence for that. We, well, one, we got, yeah. One thing I wanted to mention about the Mayans, um, I visited the Chichen Itza in Mexico. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. We've been there. And, um, I was told by the tour guide that um, the astronomers in that culture had a very high social status. They, yes. uh, mm -hmm. they, had, they were treated as um, astronomer priests. And uh, then I was very intrigued by that. Uh, so I wanted to figure out because in our society in the US right now, astronomers are not treated very highly. You know, we, we get salaries that are well below uh, that of business people. Uh, and, and anthropology is underneath you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, we're underneath you so educators I, I even lower <laughs> yep. so they thought that the astronomers can provide very accurate information about the location of the planets and the stars so that you can forecast the outcome of a war depending on when you initiate it and that was of great political value and that's why the astronomers were elevated so they collected a lot of data on the sky but had the wrong idea of how to use it so they didn't really discover the laws of uh, gravity, the way Newton did, the way Einstein did later, even though they had the data, they could have done it. Uh, so my point, the lesson of this, from this yeah. is, uh, you can have a lot of data, but if you have the wrong notion, if you have the uh, prejudice, then you will not be able to use it properly. And that's why we should be open-minded. Absolutely. And I use some of those same case studies when I'm teaching because I'm trying to get my students to be open minded, but also talk about how you perceive the world and what perspective you come from is going to taint your data. There's no doubt that that always um, that lens or rose lenses are sometimes gray lenses you look through through theory um, makes it really challenging. And going back to Tony and his friends earlier conversation. Sometimes you have all this knowledge and you have the data, but you cannot bridge that. And then again, knowing how to ask the right questions becomes really challenging for, for not only my students, but myself sometimes too. And as a social scientist, you know, trying to figure out how to look at data in a new cultural lens or a new perspective is quite, I would say the most challenging thing we do as as social scientists is trying to understand a different perspective. And there is another story about the, a fisherman that came up and uh, he said that he, he discovered the new law of nature that all fish are bigger than two inches hmm. okay and then uh, someone asked him what is the size of the holes in your net the, the fishing net that you're using <laughs> <laughs> two inches Under two inches <laughs> Thank oh, you, interesting. Yeah. There's so Thank many you. life lessons involved in here, isn't it? Because each of us have to wend our way and navigate our way through life. Each of us has to pull together a worldview and determine what questions are most important to us. And I love your comment, rigorous curiosity. I say I have an open, not a gaping mind. You call it rigorous curiosity. Could you tell us a bit about that and the life lessons, the strategies uh, for your students, for your readers, for your daughters, for us here? What life wisdom do you want to so, uh, impart to I, us? You know, I, I should say that um, it wasn't obvious to me from the start, and that's the biggest lesson I learned from doing science is, you know, I was not self-confident early on, and so I would propose a new idea. By the way, ideas come to me, you know, without too much effort. Someone tells me something, and immediately I think uh, of an idea, and I I, I bring it up and then the person says, wow, this is really interesting. I haven't thought about it. So I, I simply, you know, maybe I think differently, but it, it's not as if I go through a lot of pain and effort to come up with ideas. But at any event, throughout my career, you know, I came up with some ideas and I proposed them and then people just dismissed them. Okay, just dismiss them, said it's irrelevant. We don't care about it. It's not important. And then someone else would listen to it and, and embrace it and, and publish it. 
and then it would become the hottest thing in that field for a decade. You know, it happened to me multiple times. And after a few times, I realized, well, forget about what people say. I don't care about what people say if they dismiss it. Now, it took me a lot of time to, to get the self-confidence. And, uh, you know, it's not arrogance. It's basically saying people really don't know and they dismiss things because it, they look foreign to them. They're, they were not used to thinking that way. Um, but uh, and, and they're not playing a fair game. They dismiss it without good reason and they can agree among themselves. They can ridicule it. But just forget about people. Forget about how many likes you get on Twitter. Forget about just if you feel that there is a good reason to advocate for something, you should advocate for it. And, you know, that pretty much came to me five years ago or so. And, uh, you know, after my parents um, passed away, I realized, you know, we live for such a short time. Then let's focus on the substance. Mm -hmm. Let's uh, forget about how we look, you know, how we appear, how, what is the kind of benefit we can get for honors, awards, and membership of honor societies. Let's just talk about the substance. And that's pretty much the, the approach that I'm taking now. Now, of course, it's not easy for young people to adapt it because they depend on those senior people to get their jobs, you know, and so they cannot just forget about it and just do what they want. I can do it because I don't really care about other people right now. Um, and um, uh, but I do want to change the culture of, of um, our you know, discussion, uh, because I think academia is the place that is supposed to be blue sky, is the place where people are supposed to listen to each other and welcome uh, different ideas. There, this is supposed to be the place where it's, you know, innovation blossoms. But what I see is that innovation blossoms in the commercial sector, in companies like Apple, Google, you know, mm. these are places where there are groups of people that think blue sky and develop ideas without being ridiculed. Whereas in academia, you find this herd mentality of people trying to impress each other and they work on things that are not necessarily judged by evidence and just by uh, social pressure and, and social, uh, uh, you know, um, um, motivation. And uh, I find that to be completely inappropriate because the, uh, the tenure system in academia was designed to give people uh, job security. And we are supposed to figure out what the world is about, not uh, promote ourselves. And so that's what I'm trying to change, but it's not easy. I mean, um, well, you uh, started as a young man reading your mother's philosoph philosophical textbooks and your parents um, fomented free thinking in you, obviously, and gave you access to to what would you what would you be your advice to raising the kids of the future to be um, to seize the day? to yeah. then they're, they're going to be all of the skill sets are going to be needed to get us out of this mess How, what would you say to parents raising the next generation what's yeah. your hope first of all uh, during dinner discussions if the kid asks you a question for which you don't know the answer just say i don't know that's not so difficult most of the adults would pretend that they know much more than they actually know so when you don't know the answer say i don't know or if you are unsure say let's check it uh, just be humble. You know, what's the problem? It's, you know, if you are learning about the world, there is nothing to be ashamed of. You can be wrong and figure it out. You know, that's yeah. the whole idea of doing science, of, of being uh, you're reliant on evidence, not trying to promote your image as if you are smart, you know. Uh, let's just figure things out, you know, in a way that is honest. I think that's the best message that you can give to your kids. And very often I see adults behaving with kids in a way that is not honest, in a way that tries to um, enforce notions that are not substantiated by evidence, to enforce uh, an image that they know much more than they actually know. And I don't like it. I didn't like it when I was a kid, and I don't like it right now. And I think that's the best education that you can give to your kids, to be Inquisi inquisitive and and uh, ask questions and and then um, you know just maintain your curiosity because what happens as a result of this approach that many adults take is that the kids lose lose their curiosity and at some point they say okay we will not ask any questions anymore because we see that it damages us um mm -hmm. you know it, it damages our our chances of getting ahead and so they stop asking questions and that's called 
uh, maturing, you know, becoming like it's sort of yeah. the star. You end up with, you know, getting wounded in all of this. Be a good cog in the, in the wheel, right? Yeah, Don't break like, out of it. Say, okay, I will avoid the damage. I will avoid the confrontation. I will avoid the friction. I will not ask any question. I will not be innovative. I will not think creatively. I will just follow the herd. And of course, that's the that's what many adults uh, would prefer that there is no resistance, that everyone would do what they think. But you know, I I find that to be quite depressing. I was I found it to be depressing when I was a child, and I find it to be depressing right now uh, as an adult. If I see people uh, that agree and not check and not criticize the ideas, I find that to be counterproductive. And uh, so that's the kind of education system that I would prefer that encourages free thinking, innovation, because I think our society will be in a better place if we allow that. Um, so that, that is my biggest message. I had a father who said, um, don't believe anything just because you see it in black and white in a book. Make, go out and make up your own mind and then come and tell me about it and defend your position. Exactly. So. And he also said travel broadens the mind. So I got to go on four overseas programs in college, one of which was to Israel. I got to spend six months there. And one of the highlights was working uh, with some archaeologists for a week at a Nabataean village. And my job was to bring water to them all. And I had to say, Mi rotsi maim. <laughs> Who wants water? <laughs> so that's the extent of my knowing Israeli. But I got to hang out with, I got to hang out with a lot of Sabra. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. anyway, uh -huh. um, this has been such a delight and I appreciate your philosophy of life. I want to ask you, um, I'm sure that you look at sci-fi, which is another way for we and the general audience to embrace science is through the movies and science fiction books. Carl Sagan wrote a science fiction book I like very much, Contact. Um, so you're, you must look at it with a different, uh, more studied eye than the rest of it. What's your critique of the sci-fi and is there any worth watching out there? Is there any that really... Yeah, I cannot enjoy science fiction when it violates the laws of physics because I know the laws of physics and it doesn't yeah. sound realistic to me. So, um, but there are some good movies and some films and, and, and books uh, on sci-fi. For example, the, the film Arrival. And uh, I liked it a lot because it deals with the philosophical question of communication, linguistics. And uh, in fact, the producer of Arrival, the film, uh, contacted me a few months ago and said that he liked my book, uh, Extraterrestrial. And I said, I admired your work long before you knew about my book. <laughs> so um, I think the importance of sci-fi is that it opens the mind and it, it, it expands your imagination. And uh, there are lots of things, starting with Jules Verne. You know, he spoke about uh, submarines before they were created and so in a way it lets us imagine new technologies uh, but at the same time you know what i don't like are stories about you know humans traveling through space for example because that is a very boring journey you know it it, it just takes a huge amount of time to travel between stars it's not realistic don't think about humans doing it it will be ai systems <laughs> that can travel for millions of years without getting bored. Just think about equipment. And of course, I think that the first encounter will be with equipment. Now, this equipment will outsmart us. So we will need to use our own AI systems to figure out their AI systems, sort of like relying on our kids to interpret content that we find in the internet because they're more computer savvy. I think that there's a whole movement now to put forward a um, human rights bill for AI, dealing with AI. I actually saw a mention of that. We need to start to structure that before it, it uh, becomes a reality. Yeah. So if you were to sit down and write some sci-fi or collaborate with that filmmaker about maybe the premise of your That'd book, do you have any thoughts on that? Wouldn't yeah. that be an exciting process? I cannot comment on that because, well, there were 30 filmmakers and producers that contacted me. Oh, goodness. All right. And, and there is something in the making. <laughs> uh, okay. Non-disclosure. Okay. I, yeah. yeah. What you're doing is so valuable. Good luck with your projects. And we Thank look forward to that time. movie resulting. Thank you for inviting me. It was a great uh, conversation. I enjoyed it a lot. Yes. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. That was Avi Thank Loeb, you, Dr. Loeb. And his book is yeah. uh, Extraterrestrial, The First Sign of Intelligent Life. Beautiful. Beyond Earth.